Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Grad Cracker webinar series. Today, we're very excited to be joined by our good friends at the Royal Air Force. Grad Cracker has a long history of working with the RAF, so we are lucky enough to have worked with them since they joined us nearly 10 years ago. Today's modern day RAF is the UK's aerial peacekeeping and fighting force. They perform a wide range of duties to serve and protect the UK and the world. Joining as a graduate, you will get much more than just a job. You'll have the opportunity to travel the world and create lifelong friendships. Life in the RAF is a unique experience, so let's find out a little bit more. So firstly, I'd like you to introduce you to our guest speakers. We've got Flight Lieutenants Daniel Andrews and Nathaniel Rowan, Pete Clark and Squadron Leader Philippa Lloyd-Williams, that's mouthful, also known as Pip. So today, Samuel, sorry, today starting with you, can you give the audience an insight into today's modern day RAF? Yes, well, <clears throat> the, uh, the modern day Air Force, well, we're a very busy organisation, whether that be due to operations, uh, UK domestic taskings or training exercises, and we do train a lot. Uh, we're always doing something somewhere in the world. Uh, in terms of where we are globally, currently we have personnel or equipment in Australia, America, Canada, uh, Oman, uh, Malaysia, Sweden, Cyprus, the Falklands. Yeah, we're all over the, the globe, really. Domestically, we support our uh, emergency services in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. And we also have our quick reaction alert, uh, which helps us to defend the UK skies. Uh, in addition to this, uh, we're also on standby to assist other UK uh, government departments, such as the National Health Service, for example, during mm -hmm. COVID, where we delivered equipment or supplies to wherever it needed to be. In terms of numbers, um, we've got approximately 28, 29,000 personnel of all different ages from different parts of the country, all with their own diverse ethnic or cultural backgrounds. Modern day, the, the Royal Air Force is, is constantly changing and evolving. Uh, and a big part of that is the procurement of new equipment and technologies to help yeah. us keep up to date with um, new adversaries or at least you know stay up level with them. Um, and just as a quick example, over the last four, five, six years, we've taken ownership of several new aircraft from pilot aircrew trainer aircraft, reconnaissance aircraft, uh, right through to our uh, cutting edge fast jet strike aircraft. It really is unbelievable like, the different things that you can get involved in in mm. the RAF, isn't it? Always blows our mind, doesn't it, Jess? Well, yeah, everything that you incredible. everything that you do as a force. Um, so before we meet everybody else, Daniel, can you tell us a little bit about your role um, in the RAF? Yeah, so currently, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm in the uh, Cyberspace and Engineering Specialist Recruitment Team based here at RAF Cranwell. Um, essentially, what we're here to do is provide specialist cyberspace or engineering advice to anyone who wants to join the Royal Air Force. We have a lot of engagement activity with the public where our primary role is to essentially help with recruitment and answer any more in-depth questions people may have about the different engineering or cyberspace uh, roles we, we have. Um, the roles themselves, obviously, uh, and the RAF way of life. And also, most any myths people have or misconceptions mm -hmm. about um, the RAF as a whole. Uh, we also give advice on the uh, sponsorship scheme, which I think we're going to come on to later on. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty much it, really. Perfect. Which leads perfectly on to, Daniel, um, about the opportunities that you've currently got on your hub on Grad Cracker. So you do have the bursary scheme um, and then you've also got two um, graduate schemes as well. So you're Graduate Communications Electronics Officer and Aero Systems Officer. So tell us a little bit more about those opportunities. Yeah, so the two roles on Grad Cracker are currently as the Communication Electronics Engineer Officer. Yeah. And like you say, we have the Aero Systems Engineer Officer. The Communication Electronics Officer is essentially responsible for the management of the huge array of IT systems we have, uh, satellite communications, air defense radars, systems that uh, combat digital threats, and also the engineering and mission support systems that support our fifth and uh, sorry fourth and fifth generation aircraft. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. That's just the tip of the iceberg, really. But if you are studying a degree uh, in an appropriate engineering electronic IT, digital or computer science related subject, then uh, this role you know, might be for you. Um, as for the Aero Systems Engineering Officer, well, you're essentially responsible for making sure that aircraft are available and ready to fly. Um, mm -hmm. You provide the management uh, and oversight of all the aircraft maintenance, look after all of the uh, tooling and ground support equipment, and the teams of engineers in delivering uh, aircraft to meet operational taskings or training exercises. 
uh, similar to the CE role, uh, communication electronics, there is a lot more to it than that. But um, if you're studying a degree, um, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, uh, or an associated engineering slash uh, scientific degree, then please yeah. inquire through the, the Greg Cracker website. Uh, I think one thing to point out, which I think is really important, is that for both roles, um, you'll become an officer in the Royal Air Force, and, and with that comes a great deal of responsibility, yeah. which I think is actually mm -hmm. one of the best parts of the job. Uh, depending on how your career plays out, um, invariably you'll be uh, responsible for teams of people where you're their leader and manager, and that um, means management of the individuals themselves, uh, um, their welfare, uh, the career development, and in some cases their, their discipline. So there's a lot more to it than just being an engineer. Yeah, absolutely. Dealing with people as well every day, aren't you? And I think we'll go into that a little bit more later on in the webinar when we're speaking about you, about um, your individual roles as well. So is there anything, I know Pip's going to speak about this a little bit later on, but is there anything that you wanted to cover at this stage, Daniel, about the bursary scheme? Yeah, so the Defence STEM Undergraduate Scheme, uh, or DESA scheme as we call it, okay. uh, is a sponsorship scheme run by the Royal Air Force where we will sponsor you through your degree, paying you uh, a bursary of £5,000 per year, uh, tuition fees of up to £9,250 per year and an additional £1,500 per year for work experience or self-development training or adventurous training or even flying training if you wish. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're in your first or penultimate year, including up to Masters, you can apply for the scheme. Uh, mm -hmm. Applications are open from the 1st of September through to the 31st of March the following year. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you can apply through the Grad Cracker website or through the RF website uh, for sponsorship. Um, there are some terms and conditions that come with that. You, you'll have to join yeah. a university air squadron near to where you study uh, or, or where you live. Um, but if you are interested, search either DSIS Cyberspace Engineering Officer or um, DSIS Area Systems Engineering Officer and simply follow the application process. Perfect. Thank you very much, Daniel. We'll find out more about the application process towards the end of the webinar. Um, but as we mentioned, all of the opportunities are currently live on the Grad Cracker Hub. Um, so make sure you watch this webinar and then go and find out more um, afterwards. So thank you very much, Daniel. What I'm going to do now is just move on to the remaining panellists and find out a little bit more about you. Um, so Nathaniel, if you could tell everybody about where you went to university and what did you study? Hi Carla, thank you. Uh, so I did a Masters in Aeronautical Engineering at the University of Southampton. Perfect, thank you Nathaniel. And Pip? Uh, I did a Bachelor's degree in Electronic and Electrical Engineering at Northumbria. Lovely, thank you Pip. And last but not least, Pete? I did a Bachelor's at, uh, in Engineering Management at University of Lincoln and a Masters in Safety Critical System Engineering at the University of York. Fabulous, thank you very much. Yay, sorry, big year for York. We're, we're based near to York, so we always get excited. Um, and before I move on and hand over to Jess, tell us all why is life in the RAF no ordinary job, Nathaniel? Thanks. So for me, it's just a variation that uh, you can get into whilst you're in the RAF. So I'm an yeah. aerosystems engineer. And for me, you know, I've worked on frontline aircraft, on Chinooks. I'm uh, currently a technical uh, SME on the P-8, uh, which is a maritime patrol aircraft, and I've also done program management roles as well. So it's just the, the ability to be able to change your job and get new experiences every few years for me. Yeah, wow. perfect. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, Pip? I think for me, it's that no two days are ever the same. You think they are, and in your calendars, it'll say they're the same, but <laughs> yeah. absolutely never the same. Then you start your day and then it just spirals out of control. <laughs> you start doing one thing and by the afternoon you'll be on something completely different you didn't think you were going to do today. So. Perfect. Well, at least this webinar, you knew about that. So this is, this, yeah. at least this is novel. Thanks very much, Pip. And Pete? Uh, yeah, kind of a blend of the, both of those. Yeah. Um, my roles have taken me from being a, a regulator and doing some marking of some high level homework through to writing safety cases. And now I'm on the F-35 force uh, as a project manager for IT it's a it's a such a diverse breadth of uh, of job role and again the the last minute taskings and opportunities that you get are really yeah, yeah they're, they're nothing like anything that my peers do outside of the military yeah, yeah. keeps you on your toes perfect thank you very much Jess over to you 
Thank you very much, Carla. So, yeah, we're going to delve into a bit more um, detail about your roles now. So, Nathaniel, I'll come back to you first because you're the top of my list. Um, yeah, tell us a bit about what life is like for you in the RAF and what your role really entails. Thank you. Uh, so, at the moment, I'm based at MOD Abbeywood in Bristol, and I work on the PH Poseidon aircraft. That's a maritime patrol aircraft that's based out, based out of RAF Lossy Mouth uh, up in Scotland. So for myself uh, in this role, I work as a technical expert. So I work on the mission systems, which is uh, things like the radars and acoustics and uh, camera uh, that the aircraft has and that it uses to fulfill its mission. And so as part of my role as a technical expert, I act as a problem solver for the front line. So there are engineers up in Scotland fixing the aircraft day in and day out. And when they encounter a problem, which they're not able to solve immediately or that they're not familiar with, they'll come to me uh, for some further guidance. And, you know, if I need to, I can go back to Boeing, who make the aircraft, to ask uh, some deeper technical questions. Amazing. So you're actually based in Bristol. So the team that you work with are up in Scotland. Yep. So how does that work then? Are you Do you travel a lot for with your role, Nathaniel, or are you solely kind of behind the computer? How does it work for you? So uh, it's very blended uh, for myself. Okay. So the majority of my time is spent uh, in and around Bristol, whether that be uh, sometimes working from home or sometimes in the office uh, within Bristol, but also plenty of travel up to Lossy Mouth as well to get kind of eyes on and hands on the aircraft if there yeah. are problems and get that face-to-face -face interaction with the technicians and engineers who are um, you know, working on the aircraft day in and day out. Amazing. So how do you find also then the client side? So working with Boeing and having those relationships as well, I bet that's really exciting to see, it, you know, physically get made and then see it, you know, from the other side when you're working with the engineers and um, what it can actually do. I bet that's, you know, a really exciting part of your job. It is, definitely. And, you know, some, some of those interactions and high level interactions is something that I think uh, can be fairly unique to the RAF, having that broad, yeah. broad perspective, being able to talk with the OEM. So talking with Boeing, um and yeah it does include some some trips to america as well uh to go uh, meet with them for some of the uh, technical meetings that we hold every year uh, yeah but yeah it's, it's it's really interesting it's variation uh as i said before and just a really um yeah. a good yeah just a good tempo of work and, and yeah. uh, where you are and what you're doing next brilliant so Nathaniel, how long have you been in this role for so I've been in this role for just over a year now. Uh -huh. And how does it work then? So um, you kind of coming into this role and what was your previous roles like before and how did you decide that you were going into this role? What was the kind of transition like as well? So uh, my previous role was completely different. Uh, so I worked on Chinooks uh, in Hampshire, uh, so on a frontline squadron. So I was in charge of uh, something that we call a junior engineering officer, uh, a Jengo. <laughs> Uh, to use an acronym and uh, we I was in charge of about 50 to 60 technicians uh, on a right. shift and from there I was responsible for making sure the aircraft were fixed and ready to fly when the pilots needed them and that was anywhere in the world so during my two years there I spent time on operations in Africa exercises in Europe America spent time on the Prince of Wales aircraft carrier so all over the place really um, yeah. totally yeah. different the transition and kind of how I decided with the role was very much my preferences were taken into account. So for me, location mm -hmm. was quite important for my next job uh, because my mm -hmm. partner worked in Bristol, worked and lived in Bristol. So okay. from there, yeah. I looked at, OK, where, what area do I want to work in Bristol? And mm -hmm. from there, I kind of was provided with a list of jobs that I could have in Bristol and made a selection from there. You could do the alternative, which is, you know, what job do I want to do? I want to work at F-35, for example. You know, mm -hmm. F-35s are only based in Marham and Norfolk. So that is where you're going to live and work. Right, I see. Yeah. That's a really interesting point, actually. And as well, it's really good to see the idea of almost as you grow as an individual with your life in the RAF, you, you can also then make those decisions actually know personally, maybe you want to settle down at a certain stage of your life and think actually, you know, I want to make a base or a home in a certain location. You can do that. But then also the idea if you want to be free <laughs> and really explore, you you, you really can. Um, so that's quite unique really to the RAF, I guess. So for you, uh, Nathaniel, what was your kind of driver as, as life 
in the RAF. What why what really attracted you to to you know come and work for for them? Uh, for me, I just think uh, so. I did I did my degree at Southampton, and mm-hmm. looking around the various careers, it was just the most exciting engineering career that you could have. Um, yes. some, some of my lecturers had worked in industry and talking with them, uh, they, you know, really got into the minutiae of, you know, a wing design or an engine design or something like that. But it was very steady state kind of in the office for months, weeks, years at a time uh, doing their design work. But for me, that that didn't interest me. And I wanted something that was far more flexible, uh, far more dynamic. And, you know, the RF really offered that. Yeah, amazing. Really, really good point. So that's absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Nathaniel. Pip, I'm going to come to you next with a similar kind of question. Um, you, um, I've gone through the bursary scheme as well, so I kind of want to touch upon that. So I don't know if we should start back at the beginning, if that's okay, Pip. And you tell me a bit about your kind of backstory when we did our prep sessions before this webinar. So if you could reiterate that again to everyone, because you have an interesting story, which I think everyone would like to hear. Yeah, so... Uh, originally, I'm from the Alamand, so um, the whole reason I kind of wanted to join the RAF or the military, I think, generally at that point was because the Alamand is quite small um, and it didn't offer all of the opportunities that I guess I wanted or like needed. So I um, went through the uh, selection to go to Welbeck Defence Sixth Form College, which is now shut as a college, but it was at the time it set you up to go to what was the Defence Technical Undergraduate Scheme or now the, the, the STEM scheme that um, Daniel talked about before. Um, so I selected at 15, 16 to go to that. So did my A-levels there. I went to Northumbria. It was one of six unis that we were allowed to under the scheme go to. So it's good now that there's opportunity to go to any uni that's attached to an air squadron. Um, mm-hmm. So I did that. And that still, when, when you have to go to university air squadron every week or a squadron every week, you think it's quite a burden, but it's actually quite nice because you get to see the people that you want to be with and do that kind of stuff and do training. you got... You get paid to go and do training on a weekend, so mm-hmm. you don't really have to get a part-time job. You could go to the squadron, yeah. and get paid for it. Go <laughs> um, so okay to do sport and stuff. So you know, there's lots of benefits to it. It sounds like a bit of a nose, and you're probably like, oh, I don't want anything else to do in the evening, but it's actually quite enjoyable because you're getting paid yeah. to go, essentially. Um, so did my um degree, and then straight after the degree, we were we were given places at IoT because you'd already gone through the selection. So. Um, yeah. started IOT in the October after graduating in the July um, in back in 2015 so that's really how I got into it but um, I'd recommend that the scheme if you if you want a career and you want to get thing and you know what you want to do but also I, mm-hmm. I kind of employ people if they want to have a look at it and see kind of what the RAF may be like then University Air Squadron regardless of being on the scheme is quite a good way of doing that. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. getting that experience, isn't it? You know, mm. being and getting paid to do it. That's yeah. <laughs> really brilliant. So talk a bit about the Air Squadron then, squadron because I can imagine you've probably made friendships with people that, you know, again, have kind of followed you through a similar journey. That you'll be friends for life. Yeah, so, um, so we are slightly different away from it, but essentially it's the same. So you go together, you get lectures on like leadership, about what the RAF is like, you'll do some fitness, um, I think the UAS got to go flying where we didn't because uh, we were an army squadron so we did more of battle PT going in the freezing sea in Northumbria in <laughs> um, but like you get to go and um, you get to experience quite a lot and as an officer cadet it does open up going to different stations and getting those opportunities that you might not get if you were just to try and go to a station now so um yeah so and and on the friends for life like I now know people across the air force army and navy that I probably would never have got the chance to meet and yeah. once you know people and you see them in the mess or at work you can go oh yeah I remember you um yeah. what you're doing now and it doesn't matter how little you knew them everyone has the same thing like you've been friends yeah so you can go yeah. and chat to them I'm sure the other guys have it you like just be- because you're in a uniform and just because you've seen them and if you see them again it doesn't matter if you were or weren't friends with them so that's a real benefit I think for, for me it's, it's really useful in this job I'm in now um, to have those people that I know the names of. So, oh, I need I need your help. Yeah, <laughs> love that. That's a really good point. And I think like the uniform thing as well, knowing that you're kind of in it together, you've gone mm. through some experiences. Um, Pip, t- you've talked a bit about fitness. So that, 
I want you to bring this up. Um, I wasn't planning on bringing it up, but it's, you've reminded me. Um, because we talk about this quite a bit in your company hub on Grad Cracker. And for some people, this could put people off thinking, you know, do you have to be super, super fit? And how do you prove how fit you are? And um, so can you talk a bit about, yeah, how fit you've got to be? So there's an area of fitness test that we all have to do um, that are standards dependent on your age. So their, their age bracket, I think it's 25 to 29. I can't really remember them, but they're bracketed. Um, so you generally have to run a multi-stage fitness test or the bleep test. Uh, slightly different for one that you've probably done or you've probably heard of in civilian streets. So ours is a 20 meter one, not the 15 meter one. Yeah. So can further to run. Um, and then we have um, two minutes of, uh, no, well, sorry, one minute of press ups and one minute of sit ups. And there's a certain score you have to get dependent on your age, um, your age and where you are. Um, there's some levels of pass. So, depending on how fit you are um, in the test, you then don't have to do your fitness test for two years. And I think five years is the new one coming in or okay. a year. So it just depends. But um, the biggest thing, really, with fitness is you don't have to be a professional athlete to be in the Air Force. I'm certainly not one of them. <laughs> uh, but I think that the thing is, and, and I was at an event yesterday, and the key thing is that you are in control of your fitness. So it's the only thing you can mm. control throughout the whole thing, regardless of where you're at in your career, training, or that kind of thing. Fitness and looking after yourself is the only thing that you can you can control. So the fitter you can be to join, the, like, the absolute easier it will be for when you do it and have to take all these fitness tests and pass them quite mm. regularly. Mm-hmm. but you have the support and the network there you know if, yeah. if you're starting from scratch um which is really really good and you've got all those resources you know you know gyms everything else personal trainers mm-hmm. probably at your fingertips as well which is really really good and you know it helps for things like mental health and everything else so really really good and um, so thanks for that pip so pete i'm going to come to you next similar question you talked a bit about um your role so far so working on the f35 which sound amazing and um, so yeah tell us a bit more about that I work in the the force headquarters, which is really the what does what kind of links into where we get tasked as as a as an air force, and then how those tasks are are met. So we liaise directly with the squadrons that are at RAF Marham and external agencies that might need to support us um, to, to to deliver what we need to do. So that's um, a lot of cross cross military partnerships with the uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers and speaking down to the guys down at Abbey Wood, but also a lot into industry, um, Rolls-Royce, Lockheed Martin, and uh, again, a lot of time out in the States. Yeah, definitely. And again, it's it's probably, again, a bit naive from my point, but you forget how much um, kind of relationships you're going to be able to be building out yeah. externally out of the RAF as well and working within industry, uh, which is absolutely incredible. So, Pete, for you, what was your initial attraction, kind of going back a, a little bit to your backstory, what was your initial attraction to the RAF and why did you decide to career with them? So I I was just looking for something to, to kind of get me on a career path. and. Yeah. Full disclosure, I wasn't expecting to spend very long in the military. Okay. Um, I mean, 16 years later, it's it's <laughs> turned out to be quite a quite a different mm-hmm. sort of approach. I've seen a lot more of the world than I was expecting to. I've managed to upskill myself and do an awful lot that you wouldn't get to do in any other way. So the, the way I came to it, it was it was an interesting job. I think I was trying to find something that paid me well whilst I was learning and job building that experience I joined a little bit later than some I was in my mid-20s um but it, it was just something that kind of piqued my interest mm-hmm. I don't come from a military background family wise it just um it just it just opened up uh, some doors for me and some of the some of the things that I got to do very early in my career really just sort of solidified that it's a it's, yeah. it's a great way it's a great way to live we're going to touch upon this a bit later on, but I can imagine this is, would you say that you're set for life now in the RAF? Can you see the rest of your career playing out in the RAF? Hard question. It, it, is, it is a hard question. And I think the the one thing to be to be mindful of is we have good um, a, a really good pension scheme, which means that we've, even if I wasn't to do the rest of my working career in the Air Force, I've, I've got an, an awful lot of... Um, banked um, pension to sort of fall back on so it's 
I'd like to, to do a little bit lot more. Um, there, there are a few things that I still really want to achieve whilst I'm in the whilst I'm in the RAF, and it, it's got an exciting future. Um, yeah. My branch as NC is becoming cyberspace, so we are we're getting into a new space that's new to me. Mm. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of opportunity for me to stay in. But we'll see. See where the future holds. Watch this space. Sort of Watch things, this yeah. space. Um, okay. It's interesting for over the ten years that me and Carla have worked with the RAF, we are seeing that shifting yourselves. You know, you go, going into new areas now, um, and it is a really exciting time for the RAF in terms of you know the 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 role that roles that you've got on Grad Cracker. You know the focus now that you're all you've you've got you, know, you see with the imagery the content that we've got on the hub you know it's changing and it is really exciting which kind of leads me on to kind of the next question in terms of work-life balance and um you know, there's still those kind of misconceptions and Daniel you kind of touched upon that earlier when in when you you were speaking but what is life really like in, in the RAF and you know is there still those misconceptions that you guys hear and see when people are joining or thinking of joining that you know can you have a, a home life as well as you know life in the RAF or are you really kind of committing your life and everything you know when you do sign up and what has it been like for you so I'm going to come to you back to, to you sorry Daniel with that question and what your experiences have been when you signed up. Um, yeah, so... Um, I didn't yeah, mean to say Daniel, to be honest. Say again? I was thinking that. <laughs> I didn't know yeah, she Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> it as well. No, go on, answer. It was my fault. I was supposed to say Daniel, but I'll say Daniel. No, it's okay. We'll go with the flow. You, yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll come back to it if you need me to. <laughs> <laughs> but Daniel, go on then. My love, sorry. <laughs> no, right, thank you. Uh, so for myself, it's it can very much be a choice and a balance, as I said previously. Mm. Uh, so my previous job, I was on the frontline squadron because I really, really wanted to do that job. And yeah. because of that, I was willing to give more time. Um, and, you know, my my work-life balance definitely slanted towards work. I spent somewhere in the region of 200 days overseas in about a year yeah. and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. so that's, that was the role that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and that is, you know, going away, being responsible for people and aircraft all across the world. Mm-hmm. On the flip side, you know, I spent two years doing that, which was great. And as I said, I went I went for that location uh, type aspect and, you know, want, wanted to be at home a lot more. So I chose the location aspect so I could do that. And the job I'm in at the moment definitely gives me the uh, the work life balance. You can probably see at the moment I'm at home. So there are opportunities to work from home within that and do very much more kind of the, you know, the eight, eight to four, nine to five type job. Um, yeah. Saying that, you know, you're still still in the military. So. There are times when you have to work over Christmas or on your birthday or whatever it might be, kind of part and parcel with the job. But by all means, it's it's not a all work, no no fun sort of environment by any stretch. So for you, Nathaniel, it is kind of Monday to Friday, like you say, kind of normal working hours. Yep, at the moment, yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. and but you can choose in your next role where you could be, like you say, completely different situation. Yes, yeah, very much definitely, and it's it's you know it's your preference on how far you want to take that, your personal situation. If you want to be deployed overseas for 10 years of your life, then you can go and pick all of those punchy jobs that are doing uh, you know, super secret or operationally sensitive things all yeah. across the world, if that's, your, yeah. if that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. Yeah. Ken, it must be so exciting to start at the RAF, knowing that you can almost have multiple careers. Mm-hmm. You know, you can have those kind of nine to five, you know, Monday to Friday, or like you say, you could, you know, one, you know, and one year later think actually, no, this is not for me anymore. I want to do something crazy and go and work abroad. Um, Pip, if you had a similar experience, um, and do you ever hear of any misconceptions like that? Yeah, so it's fairly similar to be honest. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in this job now at High Wycombe, so um, I don't live here I live in the mess so we, we have accommodation that you get from the military that you pay you know, sort of roughly 100 pounds for I guess slightly more as you go up the ranks um so we, we pay to live in the mess so we we then have like a place to eat a place to socialize and then a place to live um so I live here in the week so Monday to Friday um for this tour because it was on promotion um I, 
I don't want to, I don't want to sound negative, but you almost get told where you're going when you get promoted. So you, you get offered the job with promotion. So I obviously took it because I, I wanted the promotion. Uh, yeah. It's an interesting job. It's an out of branch job. So it's not really an engineering job, um, which makes it more exciting, I guess, as well of why I took it and, and, and did it. Um, but I get to go home on the weekends and they're really flexible where I work. So I have a dog. He's not here today, but um, I have to take him out obviously at lunch times and, and get out with him and stuff. So they yeah. do allow me to do that. And I have a normal life outside of work. But um, sometimes you have to work a bit past four or five. And then, yeah. um, as Nathaniel said, when I was a flight commander, um, as a flight commander during COVID, so a really tough time for everybody, I'm sure. Um, I had two separate locations that were 300 miles apart. Um, so I literally had to have my phone on 24 seven and would be woken up at two in the morning with a with a, a poor um, AS1. So Air Serviceman 1 aviator ringing me up going, boss, he's coming to work and it's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and but in those tours, because that's what we're employed for really. So we are engineers, but we're also officers yeah. and managers. So you will... And you'll, you'll say now at uni, like, oh, I could not do that. But you'll find that if your team needs you, you will do anything yeah. for them, including coming in at two o'clock in the morning. If you're on leave, walking your dog on a beach, you'll still answer the phone because they need you to answer the phone. So, um, yeah, I think I think there is some kind of misconception. But I think ultimately, we are military, so we're always going to be slightly different. But they're coming around and we're getting better now of understanding that there is a work-life balance, but it just depends on your job obviously what's going on in the news that like our teams were very busy with what's been going on in the news um so it just depends yeah Pip, you've made some amazing points there you know really good mm. points I think you know it kind of also circles back to you know when you were first saying you know it's kind of like the uniform you're all pulling together you know you're working as part of a team and if you do get that phone call at two o'clock in the morning you're going to answer it because you know someone in your team needs your help and you're going to be there no matter what um and it's got such a lovely morale to it mm -hmm. <laughs> do you know what I mean it's like a family isn't it that you'll be there and you'll do it no matter what like I say it's 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 really nice it's, it almost feels nice to be part of something as well um, yeah yeah so you, you you find that there are some people that that are very mil militant in the military about no my job is half eight till half five that's what I'm doing yeah. but you find the majority of the time that as soon as somebody else says I'm struggling I need your help can you help me you will all do it it sounds really cliche and I'm sure the other guys are, are sat there like that doesn't happen here but you find <laughs> more often than not it does happen but as soon as you're a flight commander and you get put in that position you'll you'll do anything no matter how much it tires you out or breaks you but you only do it for up to three years so I did mine for two year, two and a half years and in that two and a half years you just give your life away but you then get it back so yeah cool. it sounds very cliche and I'm sure it, it does to the other guys too but people do pull together and I think as well, you know, if you were to compare that with other industries and other kind of graduate programs, you know, when we're speaking to other grads going in other industries, you know, they are, you know, there are almost, you know, we want to learn everything, we'll do everything. And that's almost what it's it's about. It's yeah, kind of yeah. training, understanding your trade, understanding, you know, you know, where you work, what you're doing. And um, so it's almost no different in that sense, is it? Mm -hmm. Um Daniel, I will give you a chance to speak. Do you want to add anything to that? Um you sure it's my turn to speak? <laughs> okay, good. All right, let's go. Um, yeah, I think um, what Pip said, Mom said, is um, is is spot on. Really, essentially, when you come a flight commander, like I mentioned earlier on, it, there's a lot of responsibility with that, um, and you've got to try and do your best for your people because it's your people uh, and your teams who produce what needs to get done. You know, they're the backbone of the air force. So what you need to do, um, a little goes a long way uh, when, you, when you're talking about managing people and leading them. Mm -hmm. So I'd certainly agree. Yeah, you know, people's welfare, like I mentioned earlier on, um, is something that's hugely important. And, and what might seem to be perhaps, you know, a small issue with them or a small problem for them, um, or sorry, to you, maybe a huge thing for them. So you need to kind of put that into context. Yeah. And I've had first-hand experience of where people have been struggling with one thing or another, whether it's their personal life, whether it's work or whatever it may be. Um, and when you, you know, help somebody and see them come through the other side, that, that's worth its weight in gold for me. I think mm -hmm. that's the best part of the job. So, yeah, I kind of go with what Piff said there. Yeah, amazing. Really, really good point. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs>
Um, Pete, I'm going to come to you on the the next question because I feel like this question is kind of made for you because you've had a bit of a unique experience as well when you joined uh, the REF in terms of training and how um, you had that support in terms of um, you know, helping with your bachelor's and your master's kind of qualifications. So could you tell us about the kind of educational opportunities that the REF have offered you so far in your career? Yes, so when I did the when I took my commission and um, joined as uh, an engineer at Comms Electronics, we part of our syllabus was mapped across to the University of Lincoln's Engineering and Management undergraduate degree. So mm-hmm. although some graduates may may have degrees when they come in, this is yep. still going to be open to them, and they can actually take that and you know uh, work their way to a second degree by doing some top up modules outside. Now I used um, an enhanced learning credit, so the Air Force paid most of that. I think I paid about seven or eight hundred pounds for my mm-hmm. entire undergraduate degree. Yeah. So a few years later, uh, just by application, I applied to do a master's and fully funded uh, full time. So I was technically posted to the University of York. Uh, happened during COVID, so I didn't get to go to the University of York, unfortunately. But yeah. um, my um, my entire course there was delivered online I got mm-hmm. my full salary um whilst what's going through if I would have been up there they would have paid for my accommodation everything that I'd have needed to, to get through it and they paid all of the tuition fees and all I had to do was do a, a three-year return of service back so just meant that I couldn't leave the air force for three years mm-hmm. yeah having done that so it's a it's a really op- interesting opportunity and I think there's there's two of them every three years in just that subject and there's a number of others that go along and I think the further up the rank structure you go there's more of those that are available. Wow so Pete um, in terms of so you did your bachelor's then went on to do your master's how did you decide what qualification you were going to do and what you're going to specialize in when you're going to do your master's did they did the REF kind of encourage you and say well we would like you to do this or was it totally your decision your choice? So I, my first job was working at the the military aviation authority. So I was actually working in safety anyway, but I was working in safety from a regulatory perspective. Um, I was aware that there was another job that was effectively writing the safety cases that that we then marked at the at the MAA, and it was it's just a job opportunity. It was linked to that, so oh, it was okay. it wasn't even necessarily anything that I had to try and apply for. It was more just. If my next job was going to be that job, it was a, a prerequisite for it. So that mm-hmm. was why, well, that was how I ended up getting onto that. So there's, I don't think they, I don't think they're like a free form. So you can't just do it in anything. But there's right. a lot of programs. So I think there are MAs that you can do. But again, I think that might be further up, in like leadership, strategic um, leadership things as you as you progress. That's amazing. Absolutely fantastic opportunity there. And you can do that at mm. any level then, I'm guessing. Oh, gosh, if you so, yeah. the ranks, then they'll yeah. maybe mm. encourage that, won't they? Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. So could you even go further than that? Could you do a PhD if you wanted? Question? And, yeah, I know there are some uh, PhD candidates going through. I don't know how much that's being sponsored by the the RAF, but I certainly know that they, they're, they're using case studies from from the RAF to, yeah. to, to, to kind of form their thesis. And the, wow. so it may well be being funded, but I, I couldn't tell you. Sorry. Yeah, perfect. That's really, really good, Pete. Thanks for that. So yeah, really um, an exciting thought. You know, if you are have done your bachelor's, that potential idea that, mm-hmm. um, you know, you can really further your skills as well. Um, Nathaniel and Pip, going to kind of come back to you both. Nathaniel, I'll come to you first. Um, have you had any kind of additional training experiences whilst in the RAF? Yes, definitely. So uh, from an educational perspective, I've done quite a few of the um, kind of what I would class as supporting qualifications. So these are civilian recognised uh, qualifications, which normally cost a fair bit of money in the uh, civilian world, but uh, we're free to kind of apply for and uh, given with the RAF. So these are things like uh, risk management courses uh, and manage, uh, safety management courses, which mm within the aviation world and the aviation industry are kind of pre, uh, key prerequisites in That's order right. to fulfill certain roles. Yeah. Um, and also project management uh, qualifications as well. So mm-hmm. at the moment, the engineering branch offers APMP, so the Association for Project Management, it offers their uh, practitioner qualification. 
and yeah. free of charge to us. And that's, you know, several thousand pounds worth of project management qualification and qualifies you to be a, a project manager, uh, yeah, especially so within right. engineering. And definitely when you're working with industry, it's quite a key, key skill to have because, you know, you're all, always part of these larger programs. Yeah, 100%. That's really, really a good um, thing to mention. So thanks, Daniel. Pip, come to you. Any additional um, educational training you've had? Yeah, I've done quite a bit of, um, as Nathaniel said, more in the kind of supporting qualifications. So I've done, I've done APMP. Uh, I've, so I've got the project management um, thing. I've done a lot of cyber type ones. So I worked with industry. So when I was my first tour, we we had varying tool sets that the military used that were industry provided to not just specific military. So I got to go out um, to America to learn how some of those worked. Um, and I did, so I've done a, quite a few of them. Um, and I've done some kind of IT specific ones, which all kind of culminated in me then becoming a chartered engineer. So a professionally registered chartered engineer, which started, would have started at the point where you're at uni doing your degree. And then all of those things all together alongside my bachelor's degree, and other experiences and gave me that chartership. So yeah, so, so it benefits you a lot to be able to do all of those different qualifications. Yes, pinched my question there, Pip. I was gonna ask you <laughs> next question, and you've gone for it. So you technically, are you chartered now? Are you a chartered engineer? Yep, so I'm fully chartered engineer, a member of the British Computer Society. Wow. And how long did it take, if you don't mind me asking? Um, so I finished, so there are two kind of ways you can, you can do this in the Air Force. So you can use, um, non-Air Force experiences, just more what I did. Um, and then there's a way of doing it in the Air Force where, um, even in the junior ranks, um, if you get to certain points in your career, you, you can then in effect be fast tracked through to get incorporated and chartered. There's obviously you still do the interview, um, yeah. and you have to put your experiences down, but it's easier because by that point in the Air Force, I think for chartership, it's two years as a squadron leader. Um, you have the experience that's been registered um, with BCS and IT do it. And I think there's IMECI might do it as well. So there's quite a few that our branches and professions have, have gone through. Uh, but how I did it was all of my tours built up, you'd build up different experiences as long as it meets um, the Eng Council specification, um, which it did. And at certain levels, um, you, you are eligible to go forward for it. So I put mine in. Um, and then I use my degree. So your degrees at uni will all have, should all have an accreditation with certain professional bodies. So um, some of them are up to chartered, some of them are up to incorporated. So then you bring that with you. Uh, but the Air Force doesn't really care which which route you go down. Um, and at the minute, we're lucky enough in our branch or profession, sorry, both professions, air systems and communications that we have been um, um, given, we get money for doing it. So um, they will, in effect, award you or reward you for, for getting to that point, um, which is really good and a really good thing that we that we offer for our profession at this point. Uh, I can't guarantee it'll still be there in a couple mm. of years, but it, at yeah. this point, it's really, it, yeah. that reward and an award, however you want to phrase it, is is there and offered to us for that. Wow, that's hugely attractive as well, isn't it? Knowing yeah. <laughs> so many benefits here mm. that, you know, getting paid to train, getting, you know, you're going right back to... You know, your early stages, your experiences with the RAF, you know, when you do part of the, um, you know, air squadron, you know, doing that on a weekend, get paid to do it. It's like <laughs> so good. Um, so next, I want to move to um, social events, if that's OK, because, again, it, like I mentioned earlier, in terms of the sports and fitness side, it's something we talk a lot about um, on the company hub. So um, I know kind of it's a big part of RAF life. Um, so I want to kind of touch upon any activities that you've been involved in. Um, so Pete, I'll come to you if that's all right. Um, what have your activities been? What have you been involved in? And what's kind of been your favourite thing so far? So I've, I've done 16 years. So I've done a fair bit. I've played rugby in Cyprus, played rugby in Washington, D.C. on a rugby tour. I've represented the RAF and combined services playing lacrosse. I've played oh. station level cricket, netball, football, masters football. Now that I'm over thirty five, um, I've done some some water sports. A bit of um, Danesfield. I've been to the battle sites in France. Yeah. Not been skiing yet, but that's just not something that's uh, that's available, or not something that really kind of um, it, it excites me. There's a lot of things in in kind of central London that we can go and do like trips, um, Battle of Britain walks, the Church of War rooms, oh, yeah. uh, number ten, um, yeah, just some really kind of interesting um, 
really interesting bits. There's there's something on in the mess most weeks. Well, I'm sorry, most yeah. months. There is mm -hmm. a quiz every other week and stuff. So there's there's always something going on. Um, yeah. Just picking up on something Pip said earlier about she pays hundred pounds a month or two. There's a there's a charge. If you're married and live away, you don't pay for that. So um, I don't pay for my accommodation in the mess, um, and they pay me uh, mileage to to go to and from home. Um, and yes, yeah, so from a social perspective, it's it's been fantastic. The the, the inter service rivalry and things that we do. Um, so having played lacrosse against the the navy and the army was was an experience um i did i did feel good fresh out of training so i got to go and um you know sort of like run around with cannons and take them apart and throw them around it was just just some some of the experiences that you just wouldn't get anywhere yeah. else um a lot of stations have high ropes lower ropes courses we've got them at marham so you can go and do things like that and, and yeah it's just there's just so much there's literally a plethora of things mm. you just got disc golf installed at, at marham yeah it's it's almost bottomless yeah <laughs> love it perfect <laughs> daniel i want to come to you because we've been beavering away behind the scenes haven't we the last um week or so getting a new era of the hub uh built regarding the gaming network so i want to kind of talk to you a bit about that and if you could tell everyone um a bit about this particular group in the rf and what they're up to yeah so uh, i'm i'm not an e-gamer myself uh, but a lot of my friends are um and for those who are interested, we have a huge e-gaming network where we've got over a thousand members uh, and it's growing regularly who compete in uh, national level esports and inter-service events. Uh, twice a year, they have uh, gamers from all over the Royal Air Force come together for uh, an event called Insomnia, which is every April and August um, each year. And it's aimed at um, all different levels from amateurs up to your more your professional side of things. Um, and they come together to compete as a one-to-one -one as part of a team. And like I said, uh, the e-gaming community is growing and growing all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, the REF will give you time uh, away from work to be able to take part. It doesn't come out of your holiday or your leave. It's time mm -hmm. away from work to compete. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's um, a fantastic network and growing and growing week by week. So um, one of my questions was to you, Daniel, was, you know, if you are on the bursary scheme you can join this uh group as well can't you you can get involved yeah so essentially um if, if you've applied for the bursary scheme and you're kind of in the system as we say mm -hmm. um you can you can compete in these events however if there are universities or groups of people who, who are not um you know part of the bursary scheme they can still can take part but what they need to do is contact myself and i can go through the e-gaming network to, to put them mm -hmm. in touch with the other individuals to to set something up yeah yeah it's definitely worth um so the the audience watching today and anyone watching this recording it's definitely worth having a look at that page yeah. and some really interesting stuff going on there and it looks like another level it's yeah mm. it's like a gamer's uh dream so yeah definitely have a look at that There's some amazing things that they're doing um, so thanks for that, Daniel. Um, Nathaniel, Pip, coming back to you, in terms of anything extracurricular that you've been involved in, anything else that you want to add to that? Yeah, so uh, for myself, um, there's kind of there, there's the sporting side of stuff, but then we also, in the military, have something called adventurous training, which okay. covers all of those areas which aren't quite sports, so things like rock climbing, uh, mountaineering, sailing, uh, mountain biking, et cetera. And for myself, so I never sailed before, uh, before I joined the RAF. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've gone on to do several qualifications, skippering qualifications and sailing, as well as experts all around the world. So uh, one of the highlights for me was I spent three weeks sailing from New York uh, up to Nova Scotia, uh, Halifax mm -hmm. in Canada. Yeah. Uh, and the best part of it, it was almost, I think it cost me a couple of hundred pounds uh, and it didn't count as what oh sorry it uh, counted as work so it didn't have to take any holiday or anything like that mm -hmm. you know I don't think there are many employers out there who will pay you to yeah. spend three weeks sailing up the northeast yeah. coast of America <laughs> and I think we'll, we'll see the 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 kind of strap line for the RAF I don't know if you use it as much now but no ordinary job and this is literally why mm. the RAF is no <laughs> ordinary job um absolutely amazing um Pip have you got anything to add to that you probably do so 
it's amazing <laughs> you've been doing in you know, the weekend <laughs> um so it's, it's probably not as exciting so it might be a huge letdown after sailing uh, from new york to nova scotia but um as well as social and, and sports kind of thing so instead of doing sports i generally tend to be an ambassador for the air force so we do a lot of this kind of stuff where we do outreach yeah. uh, pete's got a stem ambassador t-shirt on we do a lot of that but as well, we, we've got a scheme where we mentor younger children um, or younger students, sorry, um, at A-level. So I, I do a lot of mentoring for that. So um, I spend Friday nights after going home. Friday nights, that's what I do, um, is is mentor her. So she's just got into Cambridge Uni. Um, so we've mentored her all the way through um, from January last year, all the way through. So we... we um, as well as doing kind of the more fun kind of stuff, we do the more serious kind of stuff where it's outreach and, and helping those other people, or just seeing what the Air Force is like. So, um, yeah, so I do mentoring as a big part of my additional stuff in the Air Force. Giving back. Well done, Pip. It's good that you're getting involved in that. Mm-hmm. Really, really good. Um, future. It's hard. I, I like this question because I want to know where and what the gossip is and where you're going to be in five, ten years' time. But it is, I know it's a hard uh, question to answer. Pete, I'll let you skip this one because you've already answered it. Um, Nathaniel Pip, can you answer that one? Have you got a five, ten year plan? Uh, so myself in the short term, I've got another year or two here in this job. Um, yep. And then uh, probably looking actually to get an overseas job. So the RAF has uh, fully established posts all around the world. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm looking at doing a job in Germany, in Munich. Uh, yeah. So I'll go live there with with my partner. Um, yeah. And again, funded accommodation and all those sorts of things uh, yeah. for two to three years. That's what I'm looking at next. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> I think I need, we need to join the area. <laughs> Pip, come back no. to you. Next one. Pip. So really short term future, I'm going to Romania in two weeks um, to go and do some work with them and the Finnish. Uh, going to Iceland in January to do the same job, but uh, both with Icelandics rather than uh, the Romanians. Um, so hopefully I've got another year or so here. Um, and I don't really know, I'm kind of open to see what, what is out there for my ranking and where it's at. Um, yeah. I think in the future, I, I really want to be on kind of the, the recruitment kind of side, the STEM kind of side and do a lot of that kind of stuff. That's what really interests me. But um, I'm not going to make the bold statement. I want to be a wing commander. Uh, so I'm just a newly promoted squadron leader. But <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Pip, our paths will be crossing because Daniel will be moving on. You'll be moving on to your next role, probably. That's what you normally do. So Pip, I'm sure you'll be stepping in his shoes. <laughs> we'll be working together. Not to get rid of you yet, Daniel. No, we need Daniel for the next part of the webinar. Yeah, go on then. <laughs> Come on, Daniel, tell us all about the application process. Um, well, for, for both the um, communication electronics and, and air systems roles, uh, we're recruiting now. Uh, and this applies to the, the sponsorship scheme as well, uh, if you want to get sponsored. So you'd apply like anyone else does through through the um, uh, Drag Cracker website or through the RAF website. Uh, essentially, yeah, you'll um, yeah go through the application process. Uh, there'll be a series of interviews, uh, medical, um, fitness test, and then um, because you're joining to become an officer in the Royal Air Force, you'll come to Cranwell for a day, uh, what we call Officer and Air Crew Selection Centre, where there's uh, you know more interviews, uh, sort of exercises, so on and so forth. And um, so once you get through that process, um, if you're lucky, you'll get accepted. Uh, and if you're on the bursary scheme, then um, yeah, we'll look to give you um, the money that we've obviously mentioned earlier on in terms of sponsoring you. Uh, however, if you're a direct entrant and you've got a degree, uh, you'll yeah, get, get a place on the um, what we call initial officer training. Mm-hmm. You'll go through that, complete your um, training, your specific branch training after that, and then you'll be into the Air Force. Uh, but like I say, for the area systems and communication electronics roles, um, we're applying now. It's open all year for people to to apply. Uh, and for the sponsorship scheme, um, that's open now. It runs from the 1st of September through to the 31st of March. Um, but it is strongly advised that you get um, your applications in by December or January, just to let that process uh, run its course and make sure if you are successful, then you get paid for the following uh, academic year. If anyone's got any more questions or there's any information they can't find by the Glad Cracker website or the RAF, um, then yeah, please feel free to try and get in touch and we'll, we'll tell you whatever you need to know, really. 
Yeah, definitely. And thinking about time scales then, Daniel, how, how long from putting it in your application to hopefully, fingers crossed, being successful, does that actually take? Uh, it depends, really. I mean, if you go, it, so if you apply, if you apply tomorrow, for example, yeah, and everything went the way it's meant to in terms of passing medicals and fitness tests and so on and so forth, you're looking at around sort of six months, give or take. Mm -hmm. It's only when we have issues, if there's a medical issue with someone potentially where they need to find out more information, and mm -hmm. then that goes back to individuals, GPs, or wherever it may be, that it can take a bit longer. Yeah. But um, best case, you're looking at around six months um, to, to get in, really. To get mm -hmm. given a place in, in what we call basic training, which is your initial officer training. Yeah. And and how would you say if a student was going to apply tomorrow, because we are being positive, and how could the student prepare from you know putting in an application to then getting ready for the fitness test and everything else? What advice would you give a student in that time period? Um what I'd say is so you know your reasons for, for joining the Royal Air Force, why you want to join the Air Force. Uh, and why you want to become an officer because you know it, it's a huge responsibility yeah. um, and we're only looking for the best people um, who are interested in joining um, with that with the fitness test side of things there's guidance on the RF website in terms of what you need to do uh, I think Pip mentioned earlier in terms of the um, it's called a pre-joining fitness test where it's a 2.4 kilometer run in a certain time so yeah. there's all the information on there for people to to take a look at to prepare themselves in terms of joining up, um, you'll have a filter interview. So, like I say, you know, why you want to join up, why you want to be an officer in the Air Force, um, have understanding of what's going on in the world domestically um, yeah. and also, uh, you know, globally as well. So you're kind of, you know, politically and globally astute mm -hmm. um, because obviously we deploy to all different parts of the world. So you need to know what's going on and how what you do uh, as, a, as an officer in the Air Force it sort of affects and interacts with other nations and countries and so on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, um, but that's pretty much the crux of it, really. Okay, perfect. And deadlines, things like that, what what should, I know you mentioned getting your applications in December, January, but do you have any hard deadlines that should should stick to? Yeah, so, I mean, I mean like I say, for the, um, if you're a direct entrant, like you've got a degree uh, and you want to come in straight away, you can apply any time. Yeah. But certainly with the the, the uh, sponsorship scheme, um, like say first of September to the thirty first of March, but we we strongly suggest you you get it, um, your applications in by by December um, or January. But in terms of a backstop for the sponsorship, yeah, thirty first of March is, is the last day um, yes. to get your applications in. Anything after that, you'll have to wait then until the first of oh, September the following yeah. year. So. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Daniel. I'm conscious of time because Pip needs to run at five past three to her next meeting. So. What we're going to do now is just finish off with a quick, couple of quick fire rounds and um, i think you've probably all answered this question um during your conversations with jess but in in a bit of a nutshell what would you say was your favorite thing at the RAF? and daniel i'm coming to you first um i've cheated a bit i mean i've got three so i'll just run through but the people uh the flexibility uh, flexibility to make yeah. the roles you want to do within the RAF. Um, i've been really lucky to pick up some of the best jobs um, you know that, that you can get I mean I worked on on the last James Bond film in, in one of my previous roles wow as the lead engineer for that so mm -hmm. that was fantastic um, but yeah people and flexibility and James Bond thank you very much Daniel Pips yeah mine's definitely the the teams that we work with um, that's my favorite bit yeah um, uh, Nathaniel uh, for me it's just the ability to work on the you know, top of the range, cutting edge aircraft and the range of aircraft that we can work on uh, throughout our careers. Fantastic. Thank you, Nathaniel. And Pete? I love the opportunities for sport. I get to play sort of four yeah. or five different sports a week. That's fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Pete. And interesting facts about the area. This is my favourite round, so I'm definitely getting this put in here. Um, Daniel, what's, your, what's the most interesting fact that you've got? Yeah, OK. So um, thinking back to some of the roles you could have t undertaken uh, in the Air Force, you know, during the First Second World War, you could have been a bricklayer, uh, a butcher, um, even a blacksmith, but um, pigeon keeper was one that stood out to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, um, former crews would take pigeons with them and if they had to make emergency landings somewhere, they'd send pigeons back with coordinates telling them where they were to rescue them. So yeah, I found that really, uh, really interesting. Yeah, love it. Thanks very much, Daniel. Pip. Um, so where we do our initial officer training when you go to Cranwell, um, 
during World War II, um, it was never bombed by the Germans because Hermann Goring wanted to use it as his headquarters, assuming that he would invade Britain. Uh, so his desk is currently in the library um, of RAF Grammar. So that was my interesting fact. Perfect. And the pen still there that you signed the treaty with? Yeah, so the pen that ended World War II is in with the desk, I'm pretty sure. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And um, Pete? Uh, there's a trade badge that you may have seen with a fist holding some lightning bolts. That was because in the in the Second World War, radio operators weren't allowed to talk to, directly to officers. So you had to go to the chain of command. And this was a, a, a marking to show that they had important information that was vital to the war effort and they could uh, they could bypass that. Wow. And we still use that today. Perfect. Thank you, Pete. And Nathaniel? Uh, so my fact is that the RAF has over 450 aircraft uh, in its fleet today. Fantastic, fantastic. So thank you very much. It's been brilliant. Really enjoyed the webinar today. And um, like Daniel said at the beginning and at the end, make sure you thoroughly research the RAF and get your applications in. All of the opportunities are on the hub on Gradcracker. And um, join me and Jess on Thursday next week, where we're joined by Mace, and we'll hopefully see you then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye, thank bye. You. Bye, bye.